I thought what we might do today is to like um, Finish off where we were in this um, Rossman notebook looking at uh, time series forecasting and structured data analysis um, and then we might do a little mini review of like everything we've learnt, because uh, believe it or not, this is the end. Like, there's nothing more to know about machine learning other than everything that you're going to learn next semester <laughs> and for the rest of your life. Um, but anyway, I got nothing else to teach. Um, uh, yeah, so we'll do a little review, and, and and then we'll cover like the most important part of the course, which is like um, thinking about like. What are the what are what are how are ways to think about how to use this kind of technology? appropriately um, and uh, you know effectively in a way that's a positive hopefully a positive impact on society um, So last time we got to the point where we talked a bit about um, This uh, this idea that when we were looking at like building this competition months open derived variable um, but we actually truncated it down to be no more than 24 months and we talked about the reason why being that we actually wanted to use it as a Categorical variable because categorical variables thanks to embeddings have more Flexibility in how the neural net can can use them um, And so that was kind of where we where we left off um, So let's like keep working through this um, because What's happening in this notebook is uh, Stuff which is probably going to apply to most time series data sets that you work with right? um, And as we talked about like although we use df dot apply here This is something where it's running a piece of Python code after, over every row um, and it's That's horrifically slow, right? But so we only do that if we can't find a Vectorized pandas or numpy function that can do it to the whole column at once um, But in this case I couldn't find a way to convert a year and a week number um, into a date um, without using uh, arbitrary Python um, Also worth remembering this idea of a lambda function um, Anytime you're trying to apply a function to every row of something or every element of a tensor or something like that If there isn't a vectorized version already, you're going to have to call something like data frame dot apply which will run a function you pass to every element um, so this is something like in a kind of uh, this is basically a map in functional programming um, Since very often the function that you want to pass to it is something you're just going to use once and then throw it away uh, It's really common to use this Lambda approach so this lambda is creating a function Just for the purpose of telling df dot apply what to use right so we could um, We could also have written this in a different way which would have been to say uh, Define Um, create promo to since uh, on some value return and then we could put that in here Okay, so that and that are the same thing Okay, so one approach is to define the function and then pass it by name or the other is to define the function in place using lambda all right, and so um, if you're not Comfortable creating and using lambdas, you know good thing to practice and playing around with df dot apply is a good way to good way to practice it uh, Okay, so let's talk about um, this durations section which May at first seem a Little specific, but actually it turns out not to be um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, three fields promo state holiday and School holiday and so basically what we have is a table of um, for each store for each 
date does that store have a promo going on at that date? Uh, is there a school holiday in that region of that store at that date? Is there a state holiday in that region for that store at that date? Okay, and so this kind of thing is uh, You know like they're, they're events and time series with events are like very very common like if you're looking at um, oil and gas drilling data you're trying to say like the flow through this pipe you know here's an event representing when it set off some alarm you know or here's an event where the drill got stuck or or whatever right and so like most time series um, at some level will tend to represent some events so the fact that an event happened at a time is is interesting itself but very often a time series will also show some something happening before and after the event so for example in this case we're doing grocery sales prediction um, if there's a holiday coming up it's quite likely that sales will be higher before and after the holiday and lower during the holiday if this is a city-based store right because you know you're gonna you're gonna stock up before you go away to, to, to bring things with you and when you come back you've got to refill the fridge for instance right um, so it's although like we don't necessarily have to do this kind of feature engineering to, to, to create features specifically about like this is before or after a holiday um, the, the neural net you know the more we can give the neural net like the kind of information it needs the less it's going to have to learn it the less that it's going to have to learn it the more we can do with the data we already have the more we can do with the you know the size architecture we already have so feature engineering even even with stuff like neural nets um, is still important um, because it means that you know we'll be able to do you know get better results with whatever limited data we have whatever limited computation we have um, so the basic idea here therefore is um, when we have events in our time series is we want to create um, at two new columns for each event uh, how long is it going to be until the next time this event happens and how long has it been since the last time that event happened so in other words how long until the next state holiday how long since the previous state holiday okay so um, that's not something which I'm aware of as existing as a Library or anything like that. Um, so we uh, I wrote it here by hand, right? And so importantly, I need to do this um, by store Right, so I want to say like because you know for this store when was this store's last promo? So how long has it been since the last time it had a promo? How long it will be until the next time it has a promo for instance? All right so um, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a little function that's going to take a field name and I'm going to pass it each of promo and then state holiday and then school holiday. Right? So let's do school holiday for example. So we'll say field equals school holiday and then we'll say get elapsed school holiday comma after. So let me show you what that's going to do. So we're going to first of all sort by store and date. Right? So now when we loop through this we're going to be looping through within a store, so store number one, January the first, January the second, January the third, and so forth. And as we loop through each store, we're basically going to say like, is is this row a school holiday or not? And if it is a school holiday, then we'll keep track of this variable called last date, which says this is the last date in which where we saw a school holiday. Okay, and so then we're basically going to append. To our result the number of days since the last school holiday that's the kind of basic idea here so there's a few interesting features one is the use of zip right so I could actually write this much more simply right I could say let's go through um, well we could basically go through like for row in df .ita, rows right and then grab the, the fields we want from each row um, it turns out uh, this is 300 times slower than the version that I have 
and uh, basically like iterating through a data frame uh, and extracting specific fields out of a row um, has a lot of overhead. Um, what's much faster is to iterate through a NumPy array. So if you take a series like df.store and add dot values after it, that grabs a NumPy array of that series. Okay, so here are three NumPy arrays. One is the store IDs, one is whatever field is, in this case let's say school holiday, and one is the date. So now what I want to do, want to do is loop through the first one of each of those lists, and then the second one of each of those lists, and then the third one of each of those lists. And like this is a really, really common pattern. I need to do something like this in basically every notebook I write. And the way to do it is with zip. All right? So zip means loop through each of these lists one at a time. And then this here is where we can grab that element out of the first list, the second list, and the third list. Okay. So if you haven't played around much with zip, um, that's a really important function to practice with. Like I say, I, I use it in pretty much every notebook I write uh, all the time. You have to loop through, um, you know, a bunch of lists at the same time. Um, all right. So we're going to loop through every store, uh, every school holiday, and every date. Uh, yes. So is it looping through like all the possible combinations of each of those, or just no. for, for one, one, one? Yeah, exactly. Two, two, one, three, one, two, three. two, two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for the question. So in this case, we basically want to say, let's grab the first store, the first school holiday, the first date. Right. So for store one, January the first school holiday was true or false. Right. And so if the, if it is a school holiday. I'll keep track of that fact by saying the last time I saw a school holiday was that day, okay? And then append how long has it been since the last school holiday, right? And if the store ID is different to the last store ID I saw, then I've now got to a whole new store, in which case I have to basically reset everything. Okay, could you pass that to Karen? What will happen to the first points that we don't have a like last uh, holiday? Yeah, so I just set uh, uh, I basically set this to some um, arbitrary starting point. It's going to end up with like the I can't remember it's either the largest or the smallest possible okay. date. Okay. Thanks. Um, and you know you may need to replace this with a missing value afterwards or some you know the zero or or whatever um, you know the, the nice thing is though thanks to values it's very easy for a neural net to kind of cut off extreme values um, so in this case I didn't do anything special with it I ended up with these like negative a billion day time stamps and it still worked fine um, okay so we can go through and so the next thing to note is um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I need to do to both the training set and the test set, right? So in the previous section, I actually kind of added this little loop where I go for each of the training data frame and the test data frame, do these things, right? So I kind of, you know, each cell I did for each of the data frames. Um, I've now got a whole uh, coming up a whole um, series of cells. That I want to run first of all for the training set and then for the test set So in this case the way I did that was I had two different cells here one which set DF to be the training set One which set to be the test set and so the way I use this is I run just this cell Right, and then I run all the cells underneath Right, so it does it all to the training set and then I come back and run just this cell and then run all the cells underneath Okay, so like this um, Notebook is not designed to be just run from top to bottom, but it's designed to be run in this particular way. And I mentioned that because like this can be a handy trick to know. Like you could of course put all the stuff underneath in a function that you pass a data frame to and call it once with a test set and once with a training set. Um, but I kind of like to 
experiment a bit more interactively, look at each step as I go. So this way is an easy way to kind of run something on two different data frames without turning it into a function. Okay, um, so this is going to, if, if I sort by store and by date, um, then this is keeping track of the last time something happened, and so this is therefore going to end up telling me how many days was it since the last school holiday. Right? So now if I sort date descending and call the exact same function, then it's going to say how long until the next school holiday. Right? So that's a kind of a nice little trick for adding these kind of event timers, arbitrary event timers, into your time series models. Right? So if you're doing, for example, the Ecuadorian groceries competition right now, you know, maybe this kind of approach would be useful for various events in that as well. Uh, do it for state holiday, do it for promo. There we go. Okay. Um, The next thing that we look at here is rolling functions. Um, so rolling functions is how we uh, rolling in pandas is how we what we call uh, create what we call windowing functions. So um, let's say I had some data. You know, something like this, right? Um, and this is like date, and I don't know, this is like sales or whatever. Um, what I could do is I could say like, okay, let's create a window around this point of like seven days, right? So it'd be like, okay, this is a seven-day window, say. Right, and so then I could take the average sales in that seven-day window, right? and then I could like do the same thing, like I don't know, over here. Right, take the average sales over that seven-day window. Right, and so if we do that for every point and join up those averages, you're going to end up with a moving average. Okay, so the kind of the the, the more generic version of the moving average. Is a window function, i.e., something where you apply to some function to some window of data around each point. Now, very often the windows that I've shown here are not actually uh, what you want. If you're trying to build a predictive model, you can't include the future as part of a moving average, right? So quite often you actually need a window that ends here. So that would be our window function, right? And so um, pandas lets you create window func arbitrary window functions using this rolling here. This here says how many time steps do do I want to apply the function to? Right? This here says if I'm at the edge. So in other words, if I'm like out here, um, should you have? Should you make that a um, a missing value because I don't have seven days to average over, or you know how, what's the minimum number of time periods to use? Right, so here I said one. Okay, and then the, optionally you can also say, do you want to set the window at the start of a period, or the end of a period, or the middle of the period? Okay, so and then within that you can then apply whatever function you like. Okay, so here I've got my weekly by store sums. Okay, so there's a nice easy way um, of getting kind of moving averages or, or whatever else. And I, you know, I should mention in pandas, um, if you go to the time series page on pandas, there's literally like, look at just the index here, time series functionality is all of this, 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 like there's lots. Because like um, Wes McKinney, who, who created this, he was originally uh, um, in hedge fund trading, I believe, and uh, you know his work was all about time series, and so I think like pandas originally was very focused on time series, and still, you know, it's perhaps the strongest part of pandas. 
So if you're playing like if you're playing around with time series computations You definitely owe it to yourself to try to learn this entire API and like it, it, it there's a lot of kind of conceptual pieces around like um timestamps and date offsets and resampling and stuff like that to kind of get your head around but it's totally worth it because otherwise you'll be writing this stuff as loops by hand it's going to take you a lot longer than leveraging what pandas already does and of course pandas will do it in you know highly optimized C code for you vectorized C code whereas your version is going to loop in Python so definitely worth you know if you're doing stuff in Time series learning the the full pandas time series API um, Which is about as about as strong as any time series API out there Okay, so at the end of all that you can see here's those kind of starting point values. I mentioned um, slightly on the extreme side um, and so you can see here the um, 17th of September store one was 13 days after the last school holiday the 16th was 12 11 10 so forth okay um, we're currently in a promotion right here this is one day before a promotion here we've got nine days after the last promotion and so forth okay um, so that's how we can add um, kind of event counters to a time series and uh, probably always a good idea when you're doing work with time series um, So now that we've done that, you know, we've got um, lots of columns in our data set um, And so we split them out into categorical versus continuous columns um, We'll talk more about that in a moment in the review section But so these are going to be all the things I'm going to create an embedding for Okay, and these are all of the things that I'm going to feed directly into the into the model So for example, we've got like competition distance, so that's distance to the nearest competitor, maximum temperature, and here we've got day of week, right? So um, So here we've got maximum temperature. Maybe it's like 22.1 because I use centigrade in Germany. We've got distance to nearest competitor might be 321 kilometers 0.7 Right and then we've got day of week Which might be I don't know maybe Saturday is a six Okay So these numbers here are going to go straight into Our vector Right the vector that we're going to be feeding into our neural net Right 22 1 321.7 Okay um, We'll see in a moment. We'll actually we'll normalize them, but more or less um, But this categorical variable we're not uh, we need to put it through an embedding right so we'll have some embedding matrix Right of if there are seven days by I don't know maybe dimension four embedding okay and so this will look up the sixth row to get back the four items right and so this is going to turn into length four vector which we'll then add here okay So that's how our continuous and categorical variables are going to work So then uh, all of our Categorical variables will turn them into pandas categorical variables in the same way that we've done before um, And then we're going to apply the same mappings to the test set right so if Saturday is a six in the training set this apply cats makes sure that Saturday is also a six in the test set For the continuous variables make sure they're all floats because PyTorch expects everything to be a float um, 
So then this is another little trick that I use um, Both of these cells define something called joined SAMP one of them defines them as the whole training set one of them defines them as a random subset Right? And so the idea is that I do all of my work on the sample, make sure it all works well, play around with different hyperparameters and architectures, and then when I'm like, okay, I'm very happy with this, I then go back and run this line of code to say, okay, now make the, make the whole data set be the sample, and then rerun it. Okay, so this is a good way, again, similar to the, what I showed you before, it lets you use the same cells in your notebook to run, first of all, on a sample, and then go back later and run it on the full data set. Um, okay, so now that we've got that joined SAMP, we can then pass it to procdf, as we've done before, to grab the dependent variable, um, to deal with missing values, and in this case we pass one more thing, which is do scale equals true. Um, do scale equals true will subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. And so the reason for that is that if our first layer, you know, it's just a, a matrix multiply, right? So here's our set of weights. And our input is like, I don't know, it's got something which is like 0.001, and then it's got something like which is like 10 to the 6, right? And then our weight matrix has been initialized to be like random numbers between 0 and 1, right? So we've got like 0 0.6, 0 0.1, etc. Then basically this thing here is going to have gradients that are nine orders of magnitude bigger than this thing here, which is not going to be good for optimization. Okay? So by normalizing everything to be mean of 0, standard deviation of 1 to start with, um, then that means that all of the gradients are going to be, you know, uh, on the same kind of scale. Um, we didn't have to do that in random forests, right? Because in random forests, we only cared about the sort order. We didn't care about the values at all, right? But, in, but with uh, linear models and things that are built out of layers of linear models, like i.e. neural nets, we care very much about the scale. Okay, so d scale equals true normalizes our data for us. Now since it normalizes our data for us, it returns one extra object, which is a mapper, which is an object that contains for each continuous variable what was the mean and standard deviation it was normalized with. The reason being that we're going to have to use the same uh, mean and standard deviation on the test set. Right, because we need our test set and our training set to be scaled in the exact same way, otherwise they're going to have different meanings. Okay, and so these um, details about making sure that your test and uh, training set uh, have the same categorical codings, uh, the same missing value replacement, and the same um, scaling normalization are really important to get right. Because uh, if you don't get it right, then your test set is, you know, not going to work at all. Okay, um, but if you follow these steps, you know, it'll work fine. Uh, we also take the log of the dependent variable, and that's because in this Kaggle competition, the evaluation metric was root mean squared percent error. So root mean squared percent error means we're being penalized based on the ratio between our answer and the correct answer. Uh, we don't have a loss function in PyTorch called root mean squared percent error. Um, we could write one, but easier is just to take the log of the dependent because the difference between logs is the same as the ratio. Okay, so by taking the log, we kind of get that for free. You'll notice like the vast majority of regression competitions on Kaggle use um, either root mean squared percent error or root mean squared error of the log. As their evaluation metric, and that's because in real-world problems, most of the time we care more about ratios than about raw differences. Right? So if you're designing your own uh, project, uh, it's quite likely that you'll want to think about using um, log of your dependent variable. 
So then we create our validation set and as we've learned before um, most of the time if you've got a uh, a problem involving a time component, your validation set probably wants to be the most recent time period rather than a random subset. Okay, so that's what I do here. When I finished modeling and I found an architecture and a set of hyperparameters and a number of epochs and all that stuff that works really well, um, if I want to make my model as good as possible, I'll retrain on the whole thing, right, including the validation set. Right? Now currently at least fast AI assumes that you do have a validation set, so my kind of hacky workaround is to set my validation set to just be one index, which is the first row, okay, and that way like all the code keeps working, but there's no real validation set. So obviously if you do this, you need to make sure that your final training is like the exact same hyperparameters, the exact same number of epochs, exactly the same as the thing that worked, because you don't actually have a proper validation set now. To check against. Uh, I have a question regarding get elapsed function, which we discussed uh, before. Uh, so in get elapsed function, we are trying to find uh, when is the next holiday, uh, like when will the next holiday come? How many how many days away is it? So yep. every year the holidays are more or less fixed. Like there will be a holiday on fourth of July, twenty fifth of December, and there is hardly any change. So can't we just look from previous years and just get a list of all the holidays that are going to occur this year? Um, maybe. I mean, in this case, I guess like that's not true of promo, right? And some holidays change, like Easter, you know. So like this, this, this way, I get to write one piece of code that works for all of them, um, you know. And it, it doesn't take very long to run. So yeah, so there might be ways if you if your data set was so big that this took too long You could maybe do it on one year and then kind of somehow copy it But um, yeah in this case uh, there was no need to and I gen you know, I always value My time over my computers time. So I try to keep things uh, as simple as I can Okay, so now we can uh, create our model Um, and so to create our model we have to create a model data object as we always do with fast AI So a columnar model data object is just a data a model data object that represents a training set a validation set and an optional test set of standard columnar, you know structured data, okay um, And we just have to tell it which of the variables should we treat as categorical Okay, and then pass in our data frames So for each of our categorical variables Here is the number of categories it has okay So for each of our embedding matrices This tells us the number of rows in that embedding matrix and So then we define what embedding dimensionality we want um, If you're doing like natural language processing Then the number of dimensions you need to capture all the nuance of what a word means and how it's used has been found empirically to be <coughs> about 600 It turns out that when you do uh, NLP models uh, with embedding matrices that are That are smaller than 600 um, You don't get as good a results as you do if you do if there's the size 600 beyond 600 it doesn't seem to improve much um, I would say that human language is one of the most complex things that we model So I wouldn't expect you to come across many if any Categorical variables that need embedding matrices with more than 600 uh, dimensions um, at the other end um, You know some things may have pretty simple kind of causality right so for example um Let's have a look State holiday, you know um, Maybe if something's a holiday Then it's just a case of like okay <clears throat> at stores that are in the city. There's some behavior There's stores that are in the country. There's some other behavior and that's about it You know like maybe it's a pretty pretty simple relationship 
So like ideally when you decide what embedding size to use you would kind of use your knowledge about the domain to decide like how complex is the relationship and so how big uh, embedding do I need right in practice you almost never know that right like you would only know that because maybe somebody else has previously done that research and figured it out like in NLP uh, so in practice you probably need to use some rule of thumb okay and then having tried your rule of thumb you could then maybe try a little bit higher and a little bit lower and see what helps so it's kind of experimental so here's my rule of thumb my rule of thumb is look at how um, how many discrete values the category has i.e. the number of rows in the embedding matrix and make the dimensionality of the embedding half of that right so for day of week which is the second one eight rows and four columns um, so here it is there right the number of categories divided by two um, but then I say don't go more than 50 right so here you can see for store there's a thousand stores I only have a dimensionality of 50 why 50 I don't know it seems to have worked okay so far like you may find you need something a little different um, actually for the Ecuadorian groceries competition you know I haven't really tried playing with this but I think we may need some larger embedding sizes um, um, But it's something to fiddle with. Prince, can you pass that left? So as your variables, uh, the cardinality size becomes larger and larger, um, you're creating more and more or like uh, bigger and bigger wider embedding, embedding matrices. Yeah. Aren't you therefore massively risking overfitting because you're just introducing so many parameters that the model can never possibly capture all that variation unless your data is absolutely huge? That's a great question. And so let me remind you about my kind of like golden rule of the difference between modern machine learning and old machine learning uh, in old machine learning we control complexity by reducing the number of parameters in modern machine learning we control complexity by regularization so um, the short answer is no I'm not concerned about overfitting because the way I avoid overfitting is not by reducing the number of parameters but by increasing my dropout or increasing my weight decay okay Um, now having said that like there's no point using more parameters for a particular embedding than I need like because regularization like is penalizing a model by giving it like more random data or by actually penalizing weights um, so we like we'd rather not use more than we have to um, but um, the kind of my general rule of thumb for designing an architecture is to you know be generous On the side of the number of parameters but yeah in this case if after doing some work we kind of felt like you know what the store doesn't actually seem to be that important then I might manually go and like change this to make it smaller or, you know or if I was really finding there's not enough data here I'm either overfitting or I'm using more regularization than I'm comfortable with again you know then you might go back um, but I would always start with like being generous with parameters And yeah, in this case, um, this model turned out pretty good. Okay, so now we've got a list of tuples containing the number of rows and columns of each of our embedding matrices. And so when we call get learner to create our neural net, that's the first thing we pass in, right? Is how big is each of our embeddings, okay? And then we tell it how many um, continuous variables we have. We tell it how many activations to create for each layer. And we tell it what dropout to use for each layer okay and so then we can go ahead and call fit okay um, so then we fit for a while and we're kind of getting something around the the point one mark all right so I tried um, running this uh, on the test set and I submitted it to Kaggle uh, during the week uh, actually last week and Here it is, okay. Private score 107, public score 103, okay. So let's have a look and see how that would go. So 107, private 103, public. So let's start on public, which is 103. Not there. 
out of 3,000. Got to go back a long way. There it is, 103. Okay, 340th. Ah, that's not good. Um, so on the public leaderboard, 340th. Let's try the private leaderboard, which is 107. Oh, fifth. So, like, hopefully you're now thinking, oh, there are some Kaggle competitions finishing soon, which I entered, and I spent a lot of time trying to get good results on the public leaderboard. I wonder if that was a good idea. And the answer is, no, it wasn't. Right? The Kaggle public leaderboard is not meant to be a replacement for your carefully developed validation set. Right? So, for example, if you're doing the iceberg competition, right? which ones are ships, which ones are icebergs, then they've actually put something like 4,000 synthetic images into the public leaderboard and none into the private leaderboard. Right? So um, this is one of the really good kind of things that tests you out on Kaggle, is like, are you creating a good validation set and are you trusting it? Because right? if you're trusting your leaderboard feedback, more than your validation feedback, then you may find yourself in 350th place when you thought you were in fifth, right? So in this case, we actually had a pretty good validation set, right? Because as you can see, it's saying like somewhere around 0.1, and we actually did get somewhere around 0.1, okay? And so in this case, the validation set, uh, sorry, the public leaderboard in this competition was entirely useless. So, Can you uh, use the box, please? So in regards to that, how much does the top of the public leaderboard actually correspond to the top of the private leaderboard? Because in the in the churn prediction challenge, there's like uh, four people who are just uh, completely above everyone else. It, it, it totally depends. You know, like if they randomly sampled the public and private leaderboard, then it should be extremely indicative. Right, um, but it might not be right. So in this case, um, oh, Kaggle's crashed. Uh, oh, here it comes. So in this case, the person who was second on the public leaderboard did end up winning. Um, SDNT came seventh. Right, so. In fact, you can see the little green thing here, right? Where else this guy jumped 96 places. Um, if, if, if we had entered with the neural net we just looked at, we would have jumped 350 places. So it, it yeah, it just depends. And so often, like, you can figure out whether the public leaderboard, like sometimes they'll tell you the public leaderboard was randomly sampled, sometimes they'll tell you it's not. Um, generally, you have to figure it out by looking at the correlation between your validation set results and the public leaderboard results to see how well they're correlated. Um, sometimes if like two or three people are way ahead of everybody else, they may have found some kind of leakage or something like that. Um, like that's often a sign that there's some trick. Okay, so that's Rossman. Um, and that brings us to the end of all of our material. Um, so let's come back after the break and do a quick review, uh, and then uh, we will talk about um, ethics and machine learning. So let's come back at, um, in five minutes. So we've learnt two ways to train a model. One is by building a tree, and one is with SGD. Okay, and so uh, the SGD approach is a way we can train a model, which uh, is a, a linear model or a stack of linear layers with nonlinearities between them. Um, uh, whereas tree building uh, specifically will give us a tree, right? And then tree building we can combine with Um, bagging to create a random forest or with boosting 
to create a GBM uh, or various other slight variations such as extremely randomized trees So it's worth like reminding ourselves of like what these things do um, So like let's let's look at some data Um, so if we've got some data like so, actually let's look specifically let's look specifically at categorical data, right? Okay, so categorical data, there's a couple of possibilities of what categorical data might look like. It could be like, okay, so let's say we've got zip code, like so we've got line 4003. Is our zip code right and then we've got like sales right and it's like 50 and like nine four one three one sales are 22 and so forth right so we've got some categorical variable so there's a couple of ways we could represent that categorical variable one would be just to use the number Right, and like maybe it wasn't a number to start. You know, maybe it wasn't a number at all. Maybe our categorical variable is like San Francisco, New York, Mumbai, and Sydney. Right, but we can turn it into a number just by like arbitrarily deciding to give them numbers. Right, so like it ends up being a number. So we could just use that kind of arbitrary number. So if if it turns out that zip codes that are numerically next to each other have somewhat similar behavior then the zip code versus sales chart might look something like this for example right um, or alternatively if the zip code versus sales like sorry if the uh, two zip codes next to each other didn't have in any way similar similar sales behavior you would expect to see something that looked more like this Like kind of just all over the place, right? Okay, so they're the kind of two possibilities So what a random forest would do if we had just encoded zip in this way is it's gonna say all right I need to find my single best split point okay the split point that's going to make the two sides have as um, small a standard deviation as possible or mathematically equivalently um, have the lowest root mean squared error so in this case it might pick um, here as our first split point because on this side there's one average and on the other side there's the other average okay and then for its second split point, It's going to say, okay, how do I split this? And it's probably going to say I would split here, right? Because now we've got this average versus this average, right? And then finally, it's going to say, okay, how do we split here? And it's going to say, okay, I'll split there, right? So now I've got that average and that average, okay? So you can see that it's able to kind of hone in On the set of splits it needs even though it kind of does it greedily top down one at a time Right the only reason it wouldn't be able to do this is if like it was just such bad luck That the two halves were kind of always exactly balanced Right, but even if that happens, it's not going to be the end of the world It'll split on something else some other variable and next time around You know, it's very unlikely that it's still going to be exactly balanced in both parts of the tree right so in practice this works just fine Um, in the second case Right, it can do exactly the same thing, right? It'll say like okay, which is my best First split right even though there's no relationship between one zip code and its neighboring zip code numerically We can still see here if it if it splits here Right there's the average on one side and the average on the other side is probably about here Right and then where would it split next? probably here Right because here's the average on one side. Here's the average on the other side Right, so again can do the same thing 
right? It's going to need more splits because it's going to end up having to kind of narrow down on each individual large zip code and each individual small zip code, but it's still going to be fine, okay? So when we're dealing with um, building decision trees for, for random forests or GBMs or whatever, um, we tend to encode um, our variables just as ordinals. Okay? On the other hand, if we were doing a, uh, a neural network, or like the simplest version, like a um, linear regression or a logistic regression, the best it could do is that, right? which is no good at all. Uh, and ditto with this one. It's going to be like that. Okay, so um, an ordinal uh, is not going to be a useful encoding for a, a, a linear model or something that stacks linear and nonlinear models together. So instead, what we do is we create a one-hot encoding, right? So we'll say like, you know, there's zero, uh, one zero zero zero. Here's zero one o o. Here's o o one o o o o one. Okay, and so with that encoding, it can effectively create like a little histogram, right? Where it's going to have a different coefficient for each level. Okay, and so that way it can do exactly what it needs to do. Can you pass that back, please? At what point does that become like too tedious for your system? Or does it not? Pretty much never. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, because remember, in real life, we don't actually actually we don't actually have to create that matrix. Instead, we can just you know have the four coefficients, right, and just do an index lookup to grab the second one, which is mathematically equivalent to multiply by the one hot encoding. Okay. So so that's no problem. Um, One thing to mention, you know, I, I know you guys have kind of been taught quite a bit of more like analytical solutions to things, um, and in analytical solutions to like a linear regression, uh, you get um, uh, you can't solve something with this amount of collinearity. In other words, Sydney. Some, you know something is Sydney if it's not Mumbai or New York or San Francisco. So in other words, there's a hundred percent collinearity between the fourth of these classes versus the other three. And so if you try to solve a linear regression analytically that way, uh, the whole thing falls apart. Now note, um, with SGD we have no such problem. Okay, like SGD, why would it care? Right? We're just taking one step along the derivative. Um, it cares a little. Right, because like in the end, the main problem with collinearity is that there's an infinite number of equally good solutions. Right. So in other words, we could increase all of these and decrease this, or decrease all of these and increase this, and they're going to balance out. Right. And when there's an infinitely large number of good solutions, it means there's a lot of kind of flat spots in the loss surface, and it can be harder to optimize. Right? So that's a really easy way to get rid of all of those flat spots, which is to add a little bit of regularization. So if we added a little bit of a little bit of weight decay, like 1e next 7 even, then that basically says these are not all equally good anymore. The one which is the best is the one where the parameters are the smallest and the most similar to each other, and so that'll again move it back to being a nice loss function. Yes? Uh, could you uh, just clarify that point you made about why one hot coding wouldn't be that tedious. Sure. Um, if we have a one hot encoded vector, right, and we are multiplying it by a set of coefficients, right, then that's exactly the same thing as simply saying let's grab the thing where the one is, right. So in other words, if we had stored this as a zero. You know, and this one has a one, and this one is a two, right? Then it's exactly the same as just saying, "Hey, look up that thing in the array." Okay, and so we call that version an embedding, right? So an embedding is a is a weight matrix you can multiply by a one-hot encoding, um, and it's just a computational shortcut. Okay, but it's mathematically the same. 
So there's a key difference. Um, so the first, you know, key difference is between like solving linear type models analytically versus with SGD. With SGD, we don't have to worry about collinearity and stuff, or at least not nearly to the same degree. Um, um, and then the difference between solving uh, a, a linear or a single layer or multi-layer model with SGD versus a tree. A tree is going to be like it's going to complain about less things, right? So in particular, you can just use ordinals as your categorical variables. And as we learned just before, um, we also don't have to worry about normalizing continuous variables uh, for a tree, but we do have to worry about it for these um, SGD trained models. Um, so then we also learned a lot about interpreting random forests in particular. And if you're interested, you may be interested in trying to use those same techniques to interpret um, neural nets. Right? So if you want to know which of my features are important in a neural net, you could try the same thing. Try shuffling each column in turn and see how much it changes your accuracy, okay? and that's going to be your feature importance for your neural net. And then if you really want to have fun, recognize then that shuffling that column is just a way of calculating how sensitive the output is to that input, which in other words is the derivative of the output with respect to that input, and so therefore maybe you could just ask PyTorch to give you the derivatives with respect to the input directly. And see if that gives you the same kind of answers, right? Um, you could do the same kind of thing for a partial dependence plot. You could try, you know, doing the exact same thing with your neural net. Uh, replace everything in the column with the same value. Do it for 1960, 1961, 1962. Plot that, right? Um, I don't know of anybody who's done these things before. Not because it's rocket science, but just because I don't know. Maybe no one thought of it, or it's not in a library. I don't know. But uh, if somebody tried it, uh, I think you should find it useful. It would make a great blog post, maybe even a paper if you wanted to take it a bit further. Um, so there's a thought that something you could do. So those, most of those interpretation techniques are not particularly specific to random forests. Um, things like the tree interpreter certainly are, because they're all about like what's inside the tree. Uh, can you pass it to Karen? We are applying tree interpreter for neural nets. How are we going to uh, make inference out of activations that the path follows, for example? Sorry. Uh, how are we going to like in tree interpreter? We are like uh, we're looking at the path, we, are, we, yeah. are, we are looking at the paths and their contributions yeah. of the features. Yeah. In this case, it will be same with activations. I guess the contributions of each activation and their path. Yeah, maybe. How are I don't we? know. I haven't thought about it. How can we like make inference out of the activations? So I'd be careful saying the word inference because no people normally use the word inference specifically to mean the same as like a test a test time mm, okay. prediction. Make, make you mean like make some kind of a, interrogate the model? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not sure. We should think about that. Okay. Um, actually, Hinton and one of his students just published a paper on how to approximate a neural net with a tree um, for this exact reason, which I, ha I haven't read the paper yet. Could you pass that? Um, so in linear regression and traditional statistics, like one of the things that we focused on was statistical significance of like the changes and things like that. And so when thinking about a tree interpreter or even like the waterfall chart, which I guess is just a visualization, um, I guess where does that fit in? Like because we can see like, oh yeah, this looks important in the sense that it causes large changes, but how do we know that it's like traditionally statistically significant or anything of that yeah. sort? Um, so most of the time I don't care about the traditional statistical significance, and the reason why is that um, nowadays the main driver of statistical significance is data volume, um, not um, kind of practical importance. And nowadays most of the models you build will have so much data that like every tiny thing will be statistically significant. Um, but most of them won't be practically significant. So my main focus therefore is practical significance, which is does the size of this influence impact your business, you know? Um, statistical significance only, you know, like it was much more important when we had a lot less data to work with. 
if you do need to know statistical significance because for example you have a very small data set because it's like really expensive to label or hard to collect or whatever or it's a medical data set for a rare disease um, you can always get statistical significance by bootstrapping um, which is to say that you can uh, randomly resample your data set a number of times uh, train your model a number of times and you can then see the actual variation in predictions Okay, so that's that's uh, with bootstrapping you can Turn any model into something that gives you confidence intervals uh, There's a paper by Michael Jordan which has a technique called the bag of little bootstraps which actually kind of Takes takes this a little bit further and well worth reading if you're interested. I uh, can you pass it to Prince uh, So you said we don't need one hot encoding matrix uh, in If you're doing random forest or if you are doing any tree based models What will happen if we do that and how bad can a model be if you do do one hot encoding for random for yeah we, d we actually did do it remember we had that like maximum category size and we did create one hot encodings and the reason why we did it was that then our um, Feature importance would tell us the importance of the individual levels and our partial dependence plot we could include the individual levels so um, It it doesn't necessarily make the model worse Um, it, it, it may make it better, but it probably won't change it much at all in, so in this case It hardly changed it. This is something that we have noticed on real data also that if cardinality is higher let's say 50 levels and If you do one hot encoding uh, the random forest performs very badly and yeah, that's right If the cardinal that's why we have that in that's why in fast AI we have that like maximum categorical size you know because at some point your one hot encoded variables become too sparse right so I generally like cut it off at six or seven um, Also because like when you get past that it kind of becomes less useful because the feature importance there's going to be too many levels to really look at uh, So can it not just uh, Not look at those levels which are not important and just gives uh, those significant features as important. Yeah, Yeah, I mean it, it's 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 it'll be okay, you know, it's just like Once the cardinality increases too high you're just you're just splitting your data up You know too much basically and so in practice uh, your your ordinal version is likely to be there's likely to be better Thanks. Uh, Okay, so Yeah, so you know, there's no time to kind of review everything But I think that's the kind of key concepts and then of course remembering that you know The embedding matrix that we can use is likely to have more than just one coefficient We'll actually have a dimensionality of a few coefficients which isn't going to be useful for most linear models But once you've got multi-layer models that's now creating a representation of your category Which is kind of quite a lot richer and you can do a lot more with it Let's now talk about the most important bit Um, we started off Early in this course talking about how um, Actually a lot of machine learning is kind of misplaced um, people focus on predictive accuracy um, Like Amazon has a collaborative filtering algorithm for recommending books and they end up recommending the book Which it thinks you're most likely to to rate highly and So what they end up doing is probably recommending a book that you already have Or that you already know about and would have bought anyway, right, which isn't very valuable What they should instead have done is to figure out like which book? Can I recommend that would cause you to change your behavior? Right and so that way we actually maximize our lift in sales due to recommendations um, and so this idea of like the difference between optimizing uh, Influencing your actions versus just kind of improving predictive accuracy Improving predictive accuracy is a really important distinction, which is like very rarely discussed um, in academia or industry uh, kind of crazily enough uh, It's more discussed in industry. It's particularly ignored in most of academia, right? So it's a really uh, Important idea which is that in the end the idea the goal of your model presumably is to influence behavior Okay, and so and remember I actually mentioned a whole um, Paper I have about this where I introduce this thing called the drivetrain approach where I talk about like ways to think about how to incorporate um, machine learning 
into like how do we actually influence um, behavior so you know that's a starting point but then the next question is like okay if we're trying to influence behavior what kind of behavior should we be influencing and how and what might it mean when we start influencing behavior right because like nowadays like a lot of the companies that you're going to end up working at are big ass companies and you'll be building stuff that can influence millions of people right so what does that mean um so um I, i'm actually i'm not going to tell you what it means because like i don't know all i'm going to try and do is make you aware of some of the issues right and and make you believe two things about them first that you should care right and second that they're big current issues right the main reason i want you to care is because i want you to want to be a good person and show you that like not thinking about these things will make you a bad person but if you don't find that convincing i will tell you this uh, volkswagen uh, were found to be cheating on their emissions tests uh, the person who was sent to jail for it was the programmer that implemented that piece of code they did exactly what they were told to do right and so if you're coming in here thinking hey i'm just a techie you know i'll just do what i'm told right that's that's my job is to do what i'm told i'm telling you if you do that you can be sent to jail for doing what you're told okay so so a don't just do what you're told because you can be a bad person and b you can go to jail okay second thing to realize is in the heat of the moment you're in a meeting with 20 people at work and you're all talking about how you're going to implement you know this new feature and everybody's discussing it and there's some part you know and everybody's like we could do this and here's a way of modeling it and then we can implement it and here's these constraints and there's some part of you that's thinking am i sure we should be doing this right that's not the right time to be thinking about that because it's really hard to like step up then and say excuse me i'm not sure this is a good idea you actually need to think about how you would handle that situation ahead of time right so i want you to like think about about these issues now right and realize that by the time you're in the middle of it right you might not even realize it's happening you know like they'll just it'll just be a meeting like every other meeting and a bunch of people will be talking about how to solve this technical question okay and you need to be able to recognize like oh this is actually something with ethical implications so um, Rachel actually wrote um, all of these slides I'm, I'm sorry she can't be here to, to present this because like she's studied this in depth and you know she's actually been in in, in difficult environments herself where she's kind of seen these things happening you know um, and you know, I, I, we know how hard it is right but let me give you a sense of like what happens right so so engineers trying to solve engineering problems is you know and causing problems is not a new thing right so um, in Nazi Germany uh, IBM uh, the, the group known as Hollerith right Hollerith was the original name of IBM and it comes from the guy who actually invented the use of punch cards for tracking the US census the first mass wide-scale use of punch cards for data collection in the world right and that turned into IBM and so at this point it, this this unit at least was still called Hollerith so Hollerith um, sold a punch card system to Nazi Germany um, and so each punch card would like code you know this is a Jew 8 gypsy 12 uh, general execution 4 death by gas chamber 6 and so here's one of these cards describing the right way to kill these various people right and so a Swiss judge ruled um, that IBM's technical assistance facilitated the tasks of the Nazis and commission of their crimes against humanity this led to the death of something like 20 million civilians um, so according to the Jewish virtual library where I got these pictures and quotes from their view is that the destruction of the Jewish people became even less important because of the invigorating nature of IBM's technical achievement only heightened by the fantastical profits to be made right 
So this was a long time ago, and you know, hopefully you won't end up working at companies that facilitate genocide, right? But perhaps you will, right? Because perhaps you'll go to Facebook, who are facilitating genocide right now, right? And I know people at Facebook who are doing this, and they had no idea they were doing this, right? So right now in Facebook, the Rohingya are in the middle of a genocide, a Muslim population of Myanmar. Um, uh, babies are being grabbed out of their mother's arms and thrown into fires. Uh, people are being killed, hundreds of thousands of refugees. Um, when interviewed, the Myanmar generals doing this say, we are so grateful to Facebook for letting us know about the uh, Rohingya fake news the words they use, the Rohingya fake news, uh, that these people are actually not human, that they're actually animals. Right? Now Facebook did not set out to enable the genocide of the Rohingya people in Myanmar. No, instead what happened is they wanted to maximize impressions and clicks. Right? And so it turns out that for the data scientists at Facebook, their algorithms kind of learnt that if you take the kinds of stuff people are interested in, and feed them slightly more extreme versions of that, you're actually going to get a lot more impressions. And the project managers are saying maximize these impressions, and people are clicking, and like it creates this this thing, right? And so the 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 potential implications are extraordinary and global, right? And this is something that like is literally happening, you know, this is October 2017. It's it's happening now. Okay. Could you pass that back there? So I just want to clarify what was happening here. So it was the facilitation of like fake news or like inaccurate media? Is yeah, what so what happened was, um, let me go into it in more detail. So what happened was in um, mid-2016, um, Facebook fired its human editors. Right? And so it was humans that decided how to order things on your homepage. Those people got fired and replaced with machine learning algorithms. And so the machine learning algorithms written by uh, data scientists like you, um, you know, they had nice clear metrics and they were trying to maximize their predictive accuracy and be like, okay, we think if we put this thing higher up than this thing, we'll get more clicks. Okay. And so it turned out that these algorithms for putting things on the Facebook newsfeed had a tendency to say like, oh, human nature is that we tend to click on things which like stimulate our views and are therefore like more extreme versions of things we already see. Okay, so um, so this was great for the kind of Facebook revenue model of maximizing engagement. It looked good on all of their KPIs, um, and so at the time. You know, there was some negative press about like, you know, I'm not sure that the stuff that Facebook's now putting on their trending section is actually that accurate, but from the point of view of the metrics that people were optimizing at Facebook, it looked terrific. Right? And so way back to October of 2016, people started noticing some serious problems. For example, it is illegal to target housing to people of certain races in America. That is illegal. And yet, um, a news organization discovered that Facebook was doing exactly that right, in October 2016. Again, not because somebody in that data science team said, like, let's make sure black people can't live in nice neighborhoods, right? But instead, you know, they found that uh, their automatic clustering and segmentation algorithm found there was a cluster of people who didn't like African Americans, and that if you targeted them with these kinds of ads, then they would be more likely to select this kind of housing or whatever, right? But the interesting thing is that even after being told about this three times, Facebook still hasn't fixed it, right? And that is to say, these are not just technical issues; they're also economic issues, right? When you start saying like the thing that you get paid for, that is ads, you have to change the way that you structure those. So that you know you either use more people that cost money, or you like are less aggressive on your algorithms to target people you know based on like um, minority group status or whatever. Um, you know that can impact revenues. And so the reason I mention this is 
you will at likely at some point in your career find yourself in a conversation where you're thinking I'm not confident that this is like morally okay and The person you're talking to is thinking in their head. This is going to make us a lot of money Right, and you just you don't quite ever Manage to have a successful conversation because you're talking about difficult different things You know and so when you're talking to somebody who may be more experienced and more senior than you and they may sound like they know what they're talking about right just realize that their incentives are not necessarily going to be focused on like How do I be a good person? You know like they're not thinking how do I be a bad person? But you know the more time you spend in industry in my experience the more desensitized you kind of get to this stuff of like okay maybe getting promotions and making money isn't the most important thing Right. So for example um, I've got a lot of friends who are very good at computer vision and some of them have gone on to create startups That seem like they're almost handmade to help authoritarian governments surveil their You know their citizens and when I ask my friends like have you thought about how this could be used in that way? You know they're, they're generally kind of offended that I ask you know, um, but but I'm asking you to, to think about this like, you know, wherever you end up working if you end up creating a startup like Tools can be used for good or for evil right and so I'm not saying like don't create excellent object act tracking and uh, Detection tools from computer vision because yeah, you could go on and use that to create like uh, a much better uh, surgical intervention robot toolkit Right, I'm just saying like be aware of it think about it talk about it, you know um, So here's one I find like fascinating and there's this really cool thing actually that meetup.com did this is from a meetup.com talk that's online um, They they think about this they actually thought about this They actually thought you know what if we built a collaborative filtering system like we learned about in class um to help people decide what meetup to go to It might notice that on the whole in San Francisco a few more men than women tend to go to techie meetups and So it might then start to decide to Recommend techie meetups to more men than women as a result of which more men will go to techie meetups as a result of which when women go to techie meetups, they'll be like, oh, this is all men I don't really want to go to techie meetups as a result of which the algorithm will get new data saying that men like techie meetups better, right? And so it continues, right? And so like a little a little bit of kind of that initial push from the algorithm can create this runaway feedback loop and you end up with like almost all male techie meetups for instance, right? And so this kind of um, feedback loop is a kind of subtle issue that you really want to think about when you're thinking about like what is the behavior that I'm changing um, with this algorithm that I'm building um, So another example which uh, is kind of terrifying is um, in this paper um, where the authors describe how a lot of departments in the US are now using predictive policing algorithms, right? So Where can we go to find somebody who's about to commit a crime? And so you know that the algorithm Simply feeds back to you basically the data that you've given it, right? So if your police department has engaged in racial profiling at all in the past then it might suggest slightly more often maybe you should go to the black neighborhoods to check for people committing crimes right as a result of which more of your police officers go to the black neighborhoods as a result of which they arrest more black people as a result of which the data says that the black neighborhoods are less safe as a result of which the algorithm says to the policeman maybe you should go to the black neighborhoods more often and so forth right and this is not like um, you know uh, Vague possibilities of something that might happen in the future. This is like documented work from top academics who have carefully studied the data and the theory Right. This is like serious scholarly work. It's like no, this is this is happening Right now and so you know again like I'm sure the people that started 
creating this predictive policing algorithm didn't think like how do we arrest more black people? Right? You know, hopefully they were actually thinking gosh, I'd like my children to be safer on the streets. How do I create, you know, a, a safer society? Right? But they didn't think about this this nasty runaway feedback loop. So actually this um, this one about social network algorithms is actually a um, article in the New York Times recently about one of my friends, Renee DeResta, and she did something um, that was kind of amazing. She set up a second Facebook account, right, like a, f a fake Facebook account, and um, she was very interested in the anti-vax movement at the time. So she started following a couple of um, anti-vaxxers and visited a couple of anti-vaxxer links. And so suddenly her news feed starts getting full of um, anti-vaxxer news along with other stuff like chemtrails and deep state conspiracy theories and all this stuff. And so she's like, huh, starts clicking on those, right? And the more she clicked, the more hardcore far-out conspiracy stuff Facebook recommended. So now when Renee goes to that Facebook account, the whole thing is just full of angry, crazy, far-out conspiracy stuff. Like that's all she sees. And so if that was your world, right, then as far as you're concerned, it's just like this continuous reminder and proof of, of, of all this stuff, right? And so again, it's like this, this is To answer your question, this is the kind of runaway feedback loop that ends up telling Myanmar generals, you know, throughout their Facebook homepage that Rohingya are animals and fake news and whatever else. Right? So you know, it's it's a lot of this comes from also from bias, right? And so, like, let's talk about bias specifically. So bias in image software uh, comes from bias in data, and so most of the folks I know at Google Brain building computer vision algorithms, um, uh, very few of them are people of color. And so when they're training the algorithms with you know photos of their families and friends, they are training them with very few people of color. And so when FaceApp then decided We're going to try uh, looking at lots of Instagram photos um, to see which ones are like you know upvoted the most. Um, without them necessarily realizing it, uh, the answer was like you know um, light colored faces. So then they built a generative model to make you more hot, and so this is the actual photo, and here is the hotter version, right? So the hotter version is like more white, less nostrils. You know, more European looking, right? And so, like, this did not go down well, um, to say the least. So, like, the the so again, you know, I, I don't think anybody at FaceApp said like, let's create something that makes people look more white, right? They just trained it on a bunch of images of the people that they had around them, okay? And this has kind of you know serious commercial uh, implications as well. They had to pull this feature, right? And they had a huge amount of negative pushback, like as they should, right? Here's another example: Google Photos uh, created this uh, photo uh, classifier: airplanes, skyscrapers, cars, graduation, and oh, gorillas. Right? So, like, think about how this looks to like most people. Like most to most people, they look at this. They don't know about machine learning. They say, "What the fuck?" Somebody at Google wrote some code to take black people and call them gorillas like that's what it looks like Right now. We know that's not what happened, right? We know what happened is you know the team, you know of, of Folks at Google computer vision experts who have none if or few people of color working in the team Uh, built a classifier using all the photos they had available to them and so when the system came along came across, you know, uh, a person uh, with dark skin, it was like, oh, I've only mainly seen that before amongst gorillas, so I'll put it in that category, right? So again, it's the bias in the data 
creates a bias in the software and again the commercial implications were very significant like Google really got a lot of bad PR from this as they should this this was a photo that some you know somebody put in their Twitter feed they said like look what look what Google photos just decided to do um, you can imagine what happened with the first international beauty contest judged by artificial intelligence right basically it turns out all the beautiful people are white again right so like you kind of see this bias in image software thanks to bias in the data thanks to by uh, lack of diversity in the teams building it uh, you see the same thing in um, natural language processing right so here is Turkish O is the uh, uh, the pronoun in Turkish which has no uh, gender right there is no he or, or versus she right Karim? no okay no he versus she um, but of course in English we don't really have a widely used ungendered singular pronoun so Google Translate converts it to this okay now there are plenty of people who saw this online and said like literally so what you know it is correctly feeding back the usual usage in English like this is you know it's it I know how this is trained this is like word to vec vectors uh, I was trained on Google News Corpus Google Books Corpus it's just telling us how things are and like from a point of view that's entirely true right like <clears throat> the biased data to create this biased algorithm is the actual data of how people have written books and newspaper articles for decades um, but does that mean that this is the product that you want to create you know does this mean this is the product you have to create right just because the particular way you've trained the model means it ends up doing this you know is this actually the design you want and can you think of potential negative implications and feedback loops this could create right and you know if any of these things bother you then now you've lucky you you have a new cool engineering problem to work on like how do I create unbiased NLP solutions and now there are some startups starting to do that and starting to make some money right so like you know these are opportunities for you it's like hey here's some stuff where people are creating screwed up societal outcomes because of their shitty models like okay or you can go and build something better right so like another example of the bias in word to vec word vectors is um, restaurant reviews rank Mexican restaurants worse because Mexico the Mexican words tend to be associated with criminal words in the US press and books more often uh, again this is like a, a real problem that is happening right now um, so you know um, Rachel actually did some interesting um, analysis of just the plain word to vec word vectors um, where she basically pulled them out and you know looked at these analogies based on some uh, research that um, had been done elsewhere and so you can see like word to vec like the the vector directions show that father is to doctor is the mother is to nurse man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker and so forth right so like it's it's really easy to see what's in these word vectors and you know they're kind of fundamental to much of the NLP or probably just about all of the NLP software we use today so like here's a great example um, so ProPublica has actually done a lot of good work in this area um, judges many judges now have access to sentencing guideline software and so sentencing guideline software says to the judge for this individual we would recommend this kind of sentence right and now of course a judge doesn't understand machine learning so like they have two choices which is either do what it says or ignore it entirely right and some people fall into each category right and so for the ones that fall into the like do what it says category here's what happens for those that were labeled higher risk right the subset of those that were labeled higher risk but actually turned out not to reoffend right was about a quarter of whites and about a half of african americans right so like nearly twice as often right um, people who didn't reoffend were marked as higher risk if they were african american and vice versa 
amongst those labeled lower risk but actually did reoffend turned out to be about half of the whites and only 28% of the African Americans. Like so like this is data which I <coughs> I would like to think nobody is setting out to create something that does this, right? But when you start with bias data, right? And you know, um the data says that whites and blacks smoke marijuana at about the same rate, but blacks are uh, jailed at I think it's something like five times more often than whites like you know the, the the nature of the justice system in America at least at the moment is That it's not it's not equal. It's not fair and therefore the data That's fed into the machine learning model is going to basically support that status quo and then because of the negative feedback loop It's just going to get worse and worse, right? I'll tell you something else interesting about this one which um, Research called Abe Gong has pointed out is here are some of the questions that are being asked, right? So let's let's take one. Um, was your father ever arrested? Right. So your answer to that question is going to decide whether you're locked up and for how long. Right? Now, as a machine learning researcher, do you think that might improve the predictive accuracy of your algorithm and get you a better R squared? It could well, right? I don't know. You know, maybe it does. You try it out. It's like, oh, I got a better R squared. So does that mean you should use it? Like, well, there's another question. Like, do you think it's reasonable to lock somebody up for longer because of who their dad was? Right? And yet, these are actually the examples of questions that we are asking right now to offenders and then putting into a machine learning system to decide what happens to them. Okay. So again, like. Whoever designed this, presumably they were like laser focused on technical excellence, getting the maximum area under the ROC curve, and I found these great predictors that give me another 0.02, right? And I guess didn't stop to think like, well, is that a reasonable way to decide who goes to jail for longer? So like putting this together, you can kind of see how this can Get you know more and more scary. Uh, we take a company like Taser, right? And Tasers are these devices that kind of give you a big electric shock, basically. And Tasers managed to do a great job of creating uh, strong relationships with some academic researchers who seem to say whatever they tell them to say. Uh, to the extent where now, um, if you look at the data. It turns out that there's a much higher probability, you know, there's a pretty high probability that if you get tased uh, that you will die. Uh, it happens, you know, not unusually. Uh, and yet, you know, the researchers who they've paid to look into this have uh, consistently come back and said, oh no, it was nothing to do with the taser. The fact that they died immediately afterwards was totally um, unrelated. Uh, it was just a random, you know, things, things happen. Um, so this company uh, now owns 80% uh, of the market for body cameras um, And they started buying computer vision AI companies and They're going to try and now use these police body camera videos to anticipate criminal activity Right and so like what does that mean? Right so is that like okay? I now have some augmented reality display saying like tase this person Because they're about to do something bad, you know. Uh, so it's like it's kind of like a, a a worrying direction, and so, you know, I'm sure nobody who's a data scientist at Taser or at the companies that they bought out is thinking like, you know, this is the world I want to help create. Um, but they could find themselves in, you know, or you could find yourself in the middle of this kind of discussion, where it's not explicitly about that topic, but there's part of you that says like. Ah, I wonder if this is how this could be used Right and and I, you know, I don't know exactly what the right thing to do in that situation is because like you can ask and of course people are going to be like no 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 um, So it's like you know, are you gonna you know what what could you do you know, you could like ask for some kind of written promise you could decide to leave You could you know start doing some research into the legality of things to say like oh, I would at least protect my own You know legal situation. Um, I don't know like have a think about how you would respond to that 
So these are some questions that Rachel created as being things to think about, right? So if you're looking at building a, a, a data product or, you know, using a model, like if, if you're building a machine learning model, it's for a reason. Okay, you're, tr you're trying to do something, right? So what bias may be in that data, right? Because whatever bias is in that data ends up being a bias in your predictions, potentially then biases the actions that you're influencing, potentially then biases the data that you come back, and you may create a feedback loop. If the team that built it isn't diverse, you know, what might you be missing? Right? So for example, um, one senior executive at Twitter called the alarm about major Russian bot problems at Twitter uh, way back well before the election. Uh, that was the one um, uh, black person in the exec team at Twitter, the one. And shortly afterwards they lost their job, right? And so like it, it, definitely having a more diverse team means having a more diverse set of opinions and beliefs and ideas and things to look for and so forth. So non-diverse teams seem to make more of these bad mistakes. Um, uh, can we audit the code? Is it open source? Check for the different error rates amongst different groups. Um, is there like a simple rule we could use instead that's like extremely interpretable and easy to communicate? Uh, and like, you know, if something goes wrong, do we have a good way to deal with it? So when um, when we've talked to people about this, and a lot of people like have come to Rachel and said like I'm I'm concerned about something my organization is doing, you know what do I do? Uh, or I'm just concerned about my toxic workplace. What do I do? And very often, you know, Rachel will say like, well, have you considered leaving? And they will say, oh, I I don't want to lose my job. Right? But actually, if you can code, you're in like 0.3% of the population. If you can code and do machine learning, you're in probably like 0.01% of the population. You are massively, massively in demand. Um, so like realistically, you know, obviously it's a, an organization does not want you to feel like you're somebody who could just leave and get another job that's not in your interest, uh, in their interest, um, but that is absolutely true. Right, and so one of the things I, I hope you leave this course with is is enough self confidence to recognize that you have the skills, you know, to get to get a job, and particularly once you've got your first job, your second job is an order of magnitude easier, right? And so you know this is important not just so that you feel like you actually have the ability to act ethically. Um, but it's also important to realize like if you find yourself in, in a toxic environment, right, which is which is pretty damn common Unfortunately, like there's a lot of shitty Tech cultures environments particularly in the Bay Area, right? If you find yourself in one of those environments um, The best thing to do is to get the hell out right and and if you don't Have the self-confidence to think you can get another job You can get trapped Right, so you know um, It's really important it's really important to know that you are leaving this program with very in-demand skills and Particularly after you have that first job. You're now somebody with in-demand skills and a track record of being employed in that area Okay, okay great So uh, yes well, This is kind of just a broad question, but what are some things that you know of that people are doing to treat bias in data? Um, you know, it's kind of like a bit of a controversial subject at the moment and There are there are like people are trying to use some people are trying to use an algorithmic approach You know where they're basically trying to say um, How can we identify the bias and kind of like subtract it out? Um, but like the, the most effective ways I know of are ones that are trying to treat it at the data level so like start with a more diverse team, particularly a team involved, you know, which includes people from the humanities like sociologists, psychologists, economists, people that understand feedback loops and implications for human behavior, and they tend to be equipped with you know, good tools for kind of identifying and tracking these kinds of problems. 
and so and then kind of trying to incorporate the solutions into the process itself um, let's say there isn't kind of like a you know uh, some standard process I can point you to and say here's how to solve it you know if, if, if there is such a thing we haven't found it yet you know it requires a diverse team of smart people to be aware of the problems and work hard at them is the short answer uh, can you pass that back please Um, this is just kind of a general thing, I guess, for the whole class. Uh, if you're interested in this stuff, the, I read a pretty cool book. Jeremy, you've probably heard of it, Weapons of Math Destruction mm -hmm. um, by Kathy O'Neill. Uh, it covers a lot of the same stuff, Yeah. just more uh, more on the topic. So yeah, thanks for the recommendation. Recommend so Kathy's great. She's also got a TED Talk. Um, I didn't manage to finish the book because it's so damn depressing. I was just like, yeah, <laughs> no more. Um, but yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's 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 very good. Um, all right. <sighs> well, that's it. Um, thank you, everybody. You know, this has been um, this has been really intense for me. Um, you know, uh, obviously, this was meant to be something that I was sharing with Rachel. Uh, so I've you know ended up doing one of the hardest things in my life, which is to teach two people's worth of course. On my own and also look after a sick wife and have a toddler and also do a deep learning course and also do all this with a new library that I just wrote um, so I'm looking forward to getting some sleep um, but it's been it's been totally worth it because um, uh, you've been amazing like I've, I'm thrilled with how you've you know reacted to uh, the kind of you know the opportunities I've given you and also to the feedback that I've given you um, so congratulations